All right, that might be the next to the last time you hear that. Okay, uh, a couple of other quick announcements here. Um, actually, just one more uh, before we start this session. Uh, one more thank you for us to dole out today. Um, she could not be with us here today, unfortunately, but uh, for any of you who follow our social media feeds for the Big Sky Passion Rail Authority, be it uh, our Facebook page or, or Twitter account or Instagram or whatever, uh, behind the scenes of that is one of our fantastic volunteers, uh, Miss Kim Whitmore, uh, who lives in San Diego, California, actually, but uh, Kim has been with us right from the beginning, has been a valued member of our communications committee team, and, and it's also just uh, indicative of how the interest in and the, the desire for the, the restoration of the expansion of passenger rail service across southern Montana and across the rest of the Northwest is not confined just to us here in Montana. It is widespread. And we've had uh, this experience from the get-go where people from around the country have come out in support of BSPRA, come out in support of our efforts, and, and lent their own time and expertise to trying to uh, help us get where we want to go. So thanks to Kim. I know she's, she's listening and watching somewhere, so thank you, Kim. All right, with that, let us get to our last panel session of the day and of the summit. And this is, uh, we made this the last one for a good reason, right? Our final session is the political and legal process of railroad restoration, uh, which is obviously a complex issue and which, uh, you know, it's, it's different depending on what kind of rail route you're, you're restoring. Obviously, the, the process of restoring a long-distance route like the North Coast Hiawatha or the Pioneer is going to be a, a different process than restoring a state-supported route somewhere. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, uh, Ms. Margie McDonald, a former representative uh, in the Montana legislature for a district here in Billings, and also uh, another fellow Glendivian, a, a born and raised uh, from in Glendive, Montana, where I'm from and, and I live and represent on the BSPRA. So Margie, welcome up here. And our panelists, uh, Karen Hedlund uh, with the U.S. Center for Transportation Board, uh, and Jim Matthews with RPA up on the stage there. And then join us, joining us remotely, we have Senator Chris Gorsek from the uh, Oregon Senate Rail Caucus, uh, Peter Fletcher from the Cross. Uh, the La Crosse, Wisconsin Area Planning Committee, and, John, and Scott Rogers from the Eau Claire Area Chamber of Commerce. It's all yours, Margie. Good afternoon. Thanks to Jason for um, introducing me, and, and it's kind of a um, coincidence that we're both from Glendive. I have to say that I was born and raised in Glendive. My parents moved there specifically because it had daily passenger rail service that connected them to the Twin Cities where they met and had gone to college. They had six kids, they raised us there. We all went to college and rode the North Coast Hiawatha, going to Missoula, going to Bozeman, going to the University of Minnesota. And um, so I grew up on this line and I have a very strong conviction that um, that it makes sense. It makes sense for the region. And that's what this panel is about. It's about how do we get it done? And um, specifically, we have uh, a group of us, a couple folks from Wisconsin. The reason they're on this panel is because they've, they've figured out ways to get it done there. And so we're drawing on some of their experience and expertise. We have um, one of our leading um, people in uh, regulation of railroads, and, and she oversees the process. She's going to talk about the steps. And then we also have one of the leading national advocates for passenger rail, and that's Jim. And then we will have a state senator from Oregon. So without much further ado, let me introduce our first panelist, which will be Scott Rogers. He is the uh, Vice President for Government and Affairs for the Eau Claire Area Chamber of Commerce. And he is also Chairman of the West Central Wisconsin Rail Coalition and um, serves on the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission. So uh, thank you very much, Scott. Um, take it away. We need to uh, unmute you, Scott. We can hear, I think I just heard you now. Um, All right, can you hear me there now? There you are, yeah, thanks. Very good. 
And I do have some slides I want to go through very quickly. Um, so I can't necessarily see them. So I'm going to assume the first one is up. It looks like it probably yeah, is. It the, is. All right, we can't see the slides as a presenter. So it should be a map of uh, West Central Wisconsin with some contact information for the West Central Wisconsin Rail Coalition. And that'll give you a sense of uh, the area that we're talking about and uh, how to contact us later if you're interested. So we're the, the uh, communities and counties immediately east of St. Paul, Minnesota, and you can go to the next slide. Uh, and we have been concentrating on getting uh, rail passenger service to our region, which would be the communities between Eau Claire, Menominee, Baldwin, Hudson, and on into the uh, Twin Cities over the tracks currently owned by the Union Pacific Railroad. You can go to the next slide. And when people think of passenger rail service in our area, they think of the 400 on the Chicago and Northwestern. And one of the reasons for that, you can go to the next slide. Uh, this is how people dress the last time you could board a passenger train in our region. We have not had service since 1963, uh, but people have been interested in having it. You can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a map of the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative, which Wisconsin and a number of Midwest states in the late 90s proposed for a network. And if you look closely at the map of Wisconsin, there's just a dotted line to Eau Claire that is a bus connection. And so leaders in our community, and you can go to the next slide, in the business and education areas thought that because of the growing population, the existence of several state universities in our area, that for our economic future, we needed really to be part of passenger rail service going forward. Next slide. Uh, example would be, we think to recruit and retain talent to our area, we need to be able to have passenger service. So our initial effort, number one, was to get on the map. So you can go to the next slide. And uh, back in 2004, Wisconsin DOT commissioned uh, some studies and they found that either some additional through service through Eau Claire as some trains going through uh, La Crosse and some through um, Eau Claire or direct or just Eau Claire to Twin Cities were feasible. Next slide. And over the years, we were successful in being included in the Minnesota rail plan as a phase one uh, route. Next slide. Uh, or the current Wisconsin state rail plan does show service through Eau Claire and West Central Wisconsin as part of uh, future connections in our rail passenger network. Next slide. We've already heard about the Amtrak Nexus service uh, proposal. Uh, it actually adopted the routes in the Wisconsin State Rail Plan uh, for future potential service. Next slide. And then you may have talked already about the FRA Midwest Regional Rail Network, which shows Chicago to the Twin Cities as a high probability or a high potential route and part of the uh, national Midwest network. Uh, next slide. And even for long distance service, uh, this was a map that all the board West had recently. I know it's been updated, but uh, potential for perhaps being included in one of the route restorations for the Northwest. You can go back to the next or go to the next slide. Uh, if you can't read the drum head on this uh, passenger train, it actually says North Coast Limited stopped in uh, Eau Claire on a postcard in the uh, early 19 teens until 1918. Uh, for a few years, that train actually ran on the Northwestern and stopped to, in Eau Claire. So we're interested in uh, going back to the future in that regard as well. You can go to the next slide. Uh, there's some animation on this one, so I'm not sure if all three bullet points will show up, but we really see three things that are possibilities and we'd like to see all of them happen. We're interested in frequent regional service between our region and the Twin Cities. Uh, through service on the Chicago to Milwaukee to Twin Cities route, whether additional frequencies uh, in, ad in addition to the one being planned for next year, uh, the FRA Midwest plan or even long distance service. And finally, we do want to be part of throughway shuttle connections to existing Amtrak stations, such as from our region to Toma. You can go to the next slide. Uh, we realize that it takes more than being on a, a map to get passenger rail service. So we've been trying to look at all of the things going on around the country with authorities and commissions uh, and uh, development of stations, uh, transit oriented development, et cetera, and even the Hartford line in Connecticut uh, on things that we could be putting together when we go to a service development plan. Next slide. We are fortunate to be part of uh, Wisconsin where we have one of the most successful state supported service in the Hiawatha service. Our state's been pretty successful at getting grants that we have written uh, letters in favor of. Next slide. Uh, 
and the the new uh, St. Paul to La Crosse, Milwaukee, Chicago service that has already been funded through grants is going to be starting sometime in the next year, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, next slide. Uh, this really gets us into some of the strategies we're undertaking right now uh, to advance our project, and one of them is that within the last year, we've had three counties and six municipalities in the area uh, pass uh, resolutions to form the Chippewa St. Croix Rail Commission. Those are really what we refer to as our regional areas, Chippewa Valley and St. Croix Valley. Uh, and you can go to the next slide. Uh, so really to represent the, the public side and to have a, under our state statutes, have an intergovernmental agreement for transportation planning. Uh, and so we've been getting that off the ground. Uh, we have several ex officio members, including uh, Union Pacific, the DOTs, our regional counties, uh, as well as the state and uh, other institutions of higher learning in our region. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, and of course, the uh, corridor identification program has been discussed already, I'm sure, at the conference. So number one, we tried to get on the map, and now our emphasis is to get in the pipeline. Um, next slide. Uh, we've, uh, we're planning on submitting expressions of interest uh, through the Chippewa St. Croix Rail Commission both for our Chicago to Twin Cities through service as well as for our regional service. Uh, next slide. So really working with Amtrak uh, and our state on the possible through service. Then one other alternative we are talking about, and you can go to the next slide there. Uh, what you see here is the uh, trade association of four carrier, four uh, contract operators that operate uh, contract service around the country, and they are very interested with the new funding opportunities and the opportunities to work with state and local sponsors to be part of the intercity passenger rail development. Next slide. Uh, Herzog is one of those. They actually won the first uh, intercity service uh, a contract with the state of Connecticut for the CT rail. They operate a number of other services around the country. And go to the next slide. Uh, these four carriers uh, operate significant uh, rail service around uh, around our uh, nation. And we are talking with them through the commission about doing a project called a market sounding, which would bring all of the stakeholders together to look at the Eau Claire to Twin Cities corridor, what it would take to operate that service and make it efficient. So you go to the last slide. Really, there's four things we've been working on. One is to get on the map. Number two, to get in the pipeline, we know that once we're in the pipeline, we need to be working on things like service development plans and who's going to be the operator. And then finally, be ready. There's going to need to be some matching funding. And uh, we um, are looking at working with our partners around the state. A lot of interest in the Green Bay area now among the business there and getting passenger rail service. So my counterpart at Green Bay and others in uh, Milwaukee and Madison developing a strategy to make sure that we, uh, in the future, get the legislative support when we do for uh, for the funding for matching uh, state services in Wisconsin. So I went kind of fast, but that's uh, really some of the things that we're working in our region to try to make this happen. Thank you, Scott, and stick around. We'll have questions at the end. So thank you. Um, next up is Jim Matthews with the Rail Passenger Association, who does not need any introduction here. So go thank ahead. You. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll go through these fairly quickly, I hope. Um, that you've heard me talk uh, for the past day and a half now about a passenger bill of rights sort of framework to examine all of these questions. This is no exception. Um, we think that the right of access is a very important element of the restoration conversation. And so one thing we're going to talk about here, at least from our point of view, we need to promote network fluidity, right? And that means there is a substantial public interest in Amtrak's access rights. Uh, and there is an executive order uh, that was signed, and that executive order calls on the Service Transportation Board to consider the carrier's fulfillment of its responsibilities under 49 U.S.C. 24308, which is about Amtrak's statutory rights, when considering other transactions. Um, Gulf Coast restoration, uh, we're hoping for a good precedent here. And um, it's embarrassing for me to say that sitting next to a sitting member of the Service Transportation Board, um, but I will just say that we are hoping for a good precedent there. Um, but speaking of the STB, one thing we think is, is clear is that the STB is about to become a much busier agency than it already is, and it's already a terribly busy agency. 
Um, and uh, we need to systematically include uh, passenger effects uh, as we begin to con concentrate more on uh, restoration efforts. Um, and we were very pleased to see that the Congress recognized that and made funding a passenger rail desk at STB a priority. Uh, at the same time, we think that with $66 billion floating around to supercharge uh, passenger rail service, it's probably time to uh, take a look at the Federal Advisory Committee Act authorities to work on setting a passenger-focused panel up to join the other uh, three that are already in, in service at the STB. They've got a very, very big job to do, and to the extent that all of us can help, I think that would be a, a useful thing. Um, permitting reform. Um, you heard my colleague Sean talk about this a little earlier. We see that this sort of overwhelming bias towards highway funding as a real policy failure for our country. Uh, there's nothing wrong with highways. We all use the highways. But it is completely out of proportion to the need, and it creates a lot of things that, that frankly, are, are disincentives uh, to other modes and are very harmful. They're harmful to people. They're harmful to the climate. Um, and right now, the environmental review system sort of perversely favors highways over expanding transit and rail. Um, so we want to see that change uh, because, again, we think that there is a, as we start talking about restoring routes and restoring service, as well as um, putting new service in place, this conversation is going to become more acute. Um, we also think that FRA is going to need more capacity. This is another agency that is going to be a very, very busy agency, much more than it already is. Uh, and so we think that um, you know, the states and the regional rail authorities need access to people with expertise in rail operations and project management. Um, and you could standardize some of these conversations and not have to keep going over the same territory over and over again. Uh, and to the point that was made in, in some of the previous panels, if we want a, a more collaborative environment, well, we have to have at least a kind of agreed framework and an agreed sort of set of lanes in which to operate. Uh, and that would help with that. Um, I mean, we think that just managing the expanded grants program is going to be a heavy lift for FRA, and we think they need more resources. They do a great job, and I count many, many of them as friends, and I think they're overworked. And I think that we're asking them, we're already asking them to do a lot, and we think they need to have more resources. Um, the one last thing I would say is the point that's been made repeatedly all afternoon is that we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. We cannot wait for things to happen. While we are waiting for the longer term efforts to take place, we have got to start doing the work now that's required. And some of that is going to mean uh, looking at getting yourself into the pipeline, or doing that, that sort of basic blocking and tackling to, to roll out why you're doing it and what your projects are and what the, the benefit is. And so you don't have to wait. Um, and so I would just urge everybody to, to, to really consider the, the exhortations that you've heard here really since yesterday. Um, you're not committing to anything, um, but we, we, you've got to raise your hand. You've got to get involved. I'm, I'm, we are happy to help with that process. Um, I'll be sitting down with uh, Kentucky DOT uh, later this week uh, having that conversation. Um, I won't say quite how it developed, but I learned uh, recently that um, Kentucky DOT didn't realize there was federal money available. And that's of, as of this week. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of work to do out here. And, um, and so to the extent that, that you know, you know of, of places that want to get involved, help them raise their hands. Uh, because you guys are here, you already have that advantage that they don't have. Help them raise their hands. Um, so that's the way to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. And next up we have um, from the Surface Transportation Board, Karen Headland, who um, has a long career in, uh, as a legal advisor to government agencies and private investors and lenders on development of, of broad-scale in infrastructure. She has now been appointed to the board. And so she's going to walk a fine line as she walks us through what the legal steps are, because she is 
literally in the process of making decisions in this area. So she'll be uh, conscientious and she knows, <laughs> she knows what the limits are, but we may not be able to ask her every question in the world. So go ahead, please. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Margie. Um, uh, first, this word from our sponsor. Uh, nothing I say represents uh, the board or any other member of the board or myself or any opinions on anything. Um, when I uh, was first approached to come uh, join you this week, I said, oh, great, I can talk about the Gulf Coast uh, proceeding because uh, the thought that that was going to be perhaps would set a precedent or some guidelines about how these issues ought to be litigated or negotiated in the future, but the process, which I will at least describe some of the elements of it, um, has taken longer than I think folks had anticipated, certainly that I did. So I'm very limited in what I can tell you about it, but I thought just walking you through the history uh, down there, which John Robert probably ought to be talking about more than me uh, because he lived it all. Uh, and is still living it, uh, uh, is, is interesting. Um, so the history of uh, service on the Gulf Coast goes well before the creation of Amtrak. And um, uh, when Amtrak was created, it took over something called the Gulf Wind, which I asked John Robert what it was, and he looked it up, and it was a train that... Uh, ran from uh, New Orleans to Jacksonville, uh, but what happened when Amtrak took over all these lines is that many of them were discontinued and uh, that was one of them. The next most important thing that happened was in 1982, Congress authorized the formation of an interstate uh, compact. And it's that interstate compact that became the Southern Rail Commission that has really been uh, the moving force uh, for restoring rail uh, along the Gulf Coast. But uh, during this period uh, following uh, Amtrak's creation and uh, particularly between 85 and 93, there was actually no passenger rail service uh, along the Gulf Coast. And when I'm talking about the Gulf Coast, this is really New Orleans to Mobile and then uh, into Florida. But in 1993, uh, the Southern Rail Commission uh, did manage to negotiate with Amtrak an extension of uh, the uh, Sunset Limited, which ran from LA to New Orleans, got them to say, okay, we'll run the Sunset Limited, it won't stop in New Orleans, we'll take it all the way uh, to Florida. Uh, and uh, in 1998, uh, the Gulf Coast was uh, actually included in FRA's uh, first high-speed, designated high-speed uh, rail network. And the high-speed rail folks still have their eye on the Gulf Coast, I should tell you that. Um, but between 2000 and 2005, uh, the Sunset Limited started having some significant problems. I should note it was the nation's first transcontinental passenger rail. Um, but that was tough, and there was more congestion on the freight lines, um, and the Sunset Limited just started chronically running uh, late. Uh, in fact, so late that sometimes they would bus people from New Orleans eastward because they had to take that train and turn it back to LA to keep it on time. It was, it was that rough. And uh, their on-time performance in the last year uh, went down to something like uh, 7%. So, last year, Hurricane Katrina. And this is what happened to the line along the Gulf Coast. The freight railroads restored that line. It's in pretty good shape today. Uh, but Amtrak chose at that point in time uh, to drop the Sunset Limited. It was having too many problems and so they just let it go. Uh, but the folks uh, in the Gulf Coast, they didn't let it go. They wanted it back. And so in 2009, beginning about that time, um, the business leaders, transportation leaders, uh, various community leaders, the mayors started getting together and talking about restored service. And I do remember at one point they invited a certain deputy administrator uh, down to Mobile. To, uh, to talk to the mayors uh, about restoring leadership. And um, 
the Southern Rail Commission uh, really took, uh, uh, took the lead on all of this and got Congress to pass, uh, as part of the FAST Act in 2015, uh, a law that uh, created something called the Gulf Coast Working Group. And uh, they went to, get, uh, uh, to, uh, to work. They were directed uh, by this statute to select a, a preferred option for restoring selected service, uh, to develop a prioritized inventory of capital projects, and uh, to do cost estimates, and also to identify both federal and non-federal uh, sources. And um, included in the Gulf Coast Working Group were Amtrak, CSX, NS, uh, the Federal Railroad Administration, the Southern Rail Commission, uh, the DOTs of Louisiana, Alabama, and Florida, and the various municipalities and communities uh, along, the, um, along the Gulf Coast. Um, ultimately, uh, they issued in 2017 a report that recommended, among other things, twice daily service between uh, New Orleans and Mobile. Uh, and they found that the Gulf Coast could probably, uh, service could commence with only about five and a half million dollars really to restore or build uh, stations that had been long uh, abandoned after Katrina. Uh, and then they thought, well, maybe another 95 million dollars of improvements would be uh, a good idea uh, to help improve uh, the runtime of uh, the passenger service. Ultimately, however, uh, CSX and NS uh, did not support the findings of the uh, working group, although they had participated in it. They did their own study, and it came back and said uh, to put passenger rail on what they described as a very congested uh, 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 freight rail route would actually cost uh, $2 billion uh, in improvements. Um, that was quite uh, a large number. They have since reduced that to around 400 uh, million. Um, Amtrak, in turn, uh, objected to the study on the grounds that uh, the freights had not shared with them or with FRA um, some of their assumptions or their methodology, which was proprietary, uh, and various inputs. Um, so things kind of came uh, to loggerheads. They did subsequently agree, this is Amtrak and the Freights, uh, to, they agreed to agree to a new modeling study. Uh, and that agreement, however, expired after a year with no study. And at that point, Amtrak then filed a, um, a petition before the Surface uh, Transportation Board. And um, this is the first application ever filed under uh, this section of the law, and I want to read to you uh, what it says up there. These are kind of the key sections. There are other provisions in the statute, uh, and the various provisions of the statute have raised various issues in the proceedings, so I won't go, I'm not going to touch on that. Uh, but the key provision is when a rail carrier does not agree to provide or allow Amtrak to provide for operation of additional trains over a rail line, Amtrak may apply to the board for an order uh, requiring the carriers uh, to provide or allow for the operation of the requested trains after a hearing on the record, and that's critical because we had one and it's really a, a trial type hearing. The board can order the carrier within 60 days to provide for operation of the service. Uh, the other most critical part of this uh, legislation says the board shall consider, when conducting the hearing, whether an order would impair unreasonably freight transportation uh, of the rail uh, carrier. Uh, all those are, are pretty loaded words. So um, this is what has uh, transpired uh, since that application uh, was filed uh, for the first year from March of 21 to February of 22. A lot of motions and replies and uh, comments were filed. And um, I would note that the Greater Northwest Passenger Rail Coalition did file uh, comments uh, for the hearing, and uh, we certainly appreciated uh, their comments. Uh, February 15th of this year, we began uh, the hearings, two days of taking testimony from the various public uh, entities uh, that are uh, in the Gulf Coast, 
uh, including some of their um, representatives, uh, including Mr. Wicker. Uh, and uh, the, we then went on for seven more days of uh, hearings before the entire board. Uh, I guess the, the staff had initially thought about, and the board had thought about actually putting this to what's called an ALJ, um, uh, a designated judge to take all the, uh, the testimony and, and come up with a recommendation. But since this was the first uh, proceeding of its type, we decided that the, the full board would hear it. And so we all sat through nine days uh, of hearings. Um, they concluded on May 12th, and at that point, uh, the chairman invited them to come back with some uh, additional uh, evidence that um, uh, he thought was, uh, was missing. Uh, that supplemental evidence was just filed a couple of weeks ago on July 17th, and the parties are going to be given uh, an opportunity to file reply to the, that supplemental evidence um, on uh, August uh, 31st. What happens after that, I don't even know. Uh, we'll have to decide, we'll have to see what's in the replies. So, um, uh, one other thing I wanted to uh, mention, because it also involves um, the uh, STB, is there is another way to uh, approach this. Uh, and I think it's been alluded to, but uh, we are also sitting on another case I cannot discuss, which is the $30 billion merger of uh, uh, the Kansas City Southern and the Canadian Pacific. Uh, but in uh, connection with uh, that merger application, and you might want to write this down because you may want to read this agreement, um, the matter itself is FD36500. Uh, and uh, they filed an agreement with Amtrak, and the number on that is 303-645. I have a copy here, uh, which I'm going to uh, give you. Uh, and in that agreement, they said, if this merger goes through, we agree that we will allow Amtrak to provide service between New Orleans uh, and uh, Baton Rouge. Uh, and then there are a number of other provisions in this agreement where they look towards uh, working together uh, with each other to provide Amtrak service on other parts of either KCS or CP, uh, including a line in Wisconsin, uh, an extension from uh, Milwaukee to uh, St. Paul. Uh, a lot of work still needs to be done on that, but it's an interesting agreement uh, to read. And uh, so um, you don't necessarily have to think about ultimately the end of this is going to be going to war against your uh, freight carrier uh, before the STB. Frankly, we would like never to see another one of these. Uh, we would like to see you all negotiate uh, your agreements. Uh, but there will be some lessons learned from this, and I'll come back next year and tell you what they are. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I think uh, we have hopefully Senator um, Gorsuch uh, on deck, and he is, serves as state senator in the Oregon State Legislature. Um, lifelong rail advocate and um, serves on the Joint Committee on Transportation and on Ways, ways and Means. So Sen Senator Gorsek, are you there? Uh, I am. Are you able to see me and hear me? We can. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for uh, having me. Um, I am uh, a, the state senator, as you said, for uh, Senate 25. That's along the Columbia River and is uh, uh, ha would have a small piece of a resurrected uh, Pioneer line. Um, the uh, situation in Oregon, and I think uh, from talking with my colleagues in Washington State, uh, it's similar there. Uh, Oregon and Washington DOTs have um, been focused primarily on uh, freeways and highways. And of course, in Washington, they also have a big focus on uh, the state ferry system. Unfortunately, in Oregon, that means that uh, while our DOT uh, has been interested in uh, Amtrak Cascades, which runs north from Eugene through Portland and then on up to Seattle, uh, and I think soon will be restored to Vancouver, DC, uh, they have not shown a lot of interest 
in uh, east-west routes. And so um, because of that and knowing that this uh, new funding was coming up, uh, I created the uh, Rail Caucus uh, in the Oregon legislature. And the reason for that is that we need to have as many legislative voices as possible uh, involved in uh, working to convince the DOT uh, and the Transportation Commission that kind of leads them, gives them guidance, that this is, that it's more important to think of the bigger picture, both north, south, and east, west, uh, than just focusing on uh, north, south. Um, we, you know, as somebody alluded to this earlier, we all use freeways and highways. There's certainly no um, animosity uh, towards those sorts of uh, facilities in the rail caucus. But the idea is that we need more options, especially when it comes to east-west. And one of the things that's uh, really important, I think, is to consider that um, it was over 20 years ago that the Pioneer was discontinued. And I don't think at that time when it was discontinued, I think at about 98 or 99, uh, that it was even getting uh, daily service. And so we would like to see daily service. We would like to see um, a line that runs from uh, city of Portland through the Columbia Gorge on the Oregon side, and then serves a whole host of important cities on down the line. So if we're talking about Pendleton, we're talking about Le Grand, we're talking about Baker City and Ontario, and then on into Boise. Um, in fact, the old pioneer uh, used to connect you right into Chicago. Um, I am right now, I, I would have liked to have been with you personally today, but I'm at a legislative uh, conference in Ontario. And sadly, I had to drive the six and a half hours to get here and kept thinking, wouldn't it have been nice if the Pioneer was in place now? Uh, so we formed this group. The great thing, and to go back again to what was said earlier, this group is bipartisan. We have MPI camera. We have people from the House and the Senate. We have people from uh, the Republican and the uh, Democratic sides. And in fact, I think even though the Democrats have, we have the majority, I think we actually have a couple more Republicans in the Royal Caucus than uh, proportionally than what you see uh, in the legislature. So this is something that's important. This is something that crosses um, a lot of lines. Um, and the one thing that I worry about uh, in talking to my DOT is that they want a policy that simply tries to get more Cascade trains. And it's like, I've, I've taken Amtrak Cascades many times, but I also took the Pioneer once in the past. I also have taken the Empire Builder, the Coast Starlight. We shouldn't be, we have to, as politicians, we have to get the, the DOTs to stop thinking so small. I think that Oregon and Washington is thinking small. We need the bigger, bolder picture. And so we're going to um, continue trying to encourage people uh, to get involved from a lot of places that you may not have uh, thought of or thought might be interested. One of the things that we have um, is you know, a very large concern about uh, climate change and greenhouse gases. And one of the ways that um, we can help deal with that is by having more trains that take more cars off the road and transport people long distances uh, without all of those extra emissions. And so one of the things that uh, we did, uh, all aboard Washington it was doing, uh, is doing a uh, train track uh, through the Northwest. And we not only invited rail advocates, but we went out of our way to invite environmental groups to be part of that discussion as well. Um, and another thing that we would like to do is encourage everybody along, for instance, the Pioneer Line in Oregon, whether that be Chambers of Commerce, whether that be uh, city councils, uh, county councils, or whatever. We want them all to add their voice because, as you all know, the more voices that are heard, uh, the more likely it is that we can 
get our departments of transportation to really take um, this seriously. And that's always um, the challenge. Um, one of my plans is also in the next uh, session, which starts in January, is to not only uh, have we suggested it to the DOT, uh, but we're also going to draft a bill that directs them to look seriously at this. Um, one of my fears is that, yes, they could be directed to do it, but if we don't apply our voice and some pressure, um, they may not give it the, uh, the emphasis that it needs. And so um, we're going to continue working on that. Um, I'm also very interested in, we'll be working with Metro, which is our regional government, uh, to talk about a way to take many of the freight lines from Portland and Western that are throughout the Portland metropolitan area and devise a plan to create a, uh, a secondary rail system that would complement our light rail system. Um, and so uh, we're in discussions about that too. But we have to think big. Uh, personally, I would like to see a line that went from Portland to Bend down to uh, Cape Falls, back up the valley, and really uh, connected uh, the major population centers to the state. Uh, it's a daunting challenge, uh, but I think it's well worth it. And uh, so I encourage all of you to uh, raise your voice uh, to these things uh, as well. And thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me today. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you so much. Next, we have Peter Fletcher from La Crosse Area Planning, where he is director of the Metropolitan Planning Organization. And um, Peter, you are up. And folks, we will go ahead and have some questions after this, but we, uh, we have five panelists, so, and we started late, so we will go a little over the hour, but we're fine. So Peter, go ahead. Can you hear me all right? Uh, yes, we can. And I think they're, they're good. Oh, do you I have some slides? slides. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, I think they're going to put some slides up. I had a Excellent. few to go through. They're coming. There they are. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, everyone, uh, you know, thank you. For, first of all, thank you for having me. I am, again, Peter Fletcher, the director of the Cross Area Planning Committee, and we serve as the MPO for the Greater La Crosse, Wisconsin area. Uh, I'll be uh, talking a little bit about additional passion of the rail service to our area, the benefits and how it became possible. Uh, first of all, as the, as the MPO, our leadership board is comprised of the mayors, village presidents, town chairs of the communities within our urbanized area. And I and my predecess predecessors have been fortunate that all those leaders through the years have recognized the importance of passenger rail service. So that has really been key to uh, our efforts. Uh, that that support has ultimately led to the project that uh, is coming to reality, the second daily train and the doubling of passenger rail service in our community. And that services, new services scheduled to begin uh, later this year. Uh, next slide. I'll just give you a little background information just who, where we're at, City of La Crosse, and who we are. It's located about halfway between the city of Milwaukee and the Twin Cities on the Mississippi River. The city has a population of around 50,000 people, and our greater urbanized area is around 110,000 people. Uh, it's a, La Crosse is the regional hub of commercial businesses and services, and it's home to two regional medical centers, public and private universities, a tech school, and is sort of the retail, employment, and biz, business center of our region. Now, historically, we've been served by the Empire Builder that provides that provides you know one train stop each day, each direction. So, uh, and as we know, service provided by the eastbound trains has been uh, somewhat unreliable due to delays uh, to the experience from from a train west of us. Now, before my time and over around 10 years ago, and uh, alluded to earlier in earlier presentations, the concept of high-speed passenger rail service in our corridor was being discussed. And as circumstances changed with that discussion over the years, ultimately what came to be the concept of an additional daily passenger train on the existing Empire Builder route that was ultimately established. Now, that additional service was discussed and is now, and that is now what is commonly referred to as the TCMC and the second train. So as you look at the map, the map illustrates shows the Empire Builder where it starts, runs from Chicago to the Twin Cities and it goes on to the Northwest. Well, the TCMC will be running on that same route, but only run between Chicago and the Twin Cities daily. And they'll provide us that, in La Crosse, that second daily train. Go to the next slide. Um, you know, how did the TCMC become a reality? Well, uh, 
first of all, keys to success. It, it had we were fortunate that it had the support of the uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin DOTs as well as Amtrak, uh, and their staff have worked diligently on the project. So that, that certainly has uh, put us a, a step up and make that happen. But also, depending on the governor and administrations who are in charge at the state levels, really determine how and at what pace the project uh, progressed. As I said, it's about a or 10 year discussion. <laughs> Uh, for example, you know, early on in the MnDOT provided a lot of the funding and studies for administrative support and Wisconsin did not. Uh, then political administrations changed and in recent years, Wisconsin DOT provided the majority of funding and administrative support and has become, has become the lead agency. I guess the most important thing about the, that process is that it kept moving forward. Uh, and uh, I kept to give a lot of credit to the Wisconsin and Minnesota DOT passenger rail staff staff that kept moving it forward. But also locally, we had, we had a role to play. Uh, and one thing that held constant through that process is that, you know, our local units government, my organizations and business organizations have, uh, you know, worked together and uh, uh, provided support for additional rail service. Now that local support manifested itself in several ways. Uh, our local units of governance and organizations on numerous occasions have been diligent and have provided letters of support or resolutions in supporting the TCMC. The key thing, here is that, that we remained in constant contact with state DOTs and as a result, we knew when the project was at key decision points. And when we, you know, when we were needed to generate visible local support, we were able to do that. Uh, LAPC staff of my organization, other local planning staff, we remained participate in planning meetings, study committees, all the way through the process. And we distributed information to the public throughout the TCMC planning process and uh, that had worked actually throughout the whole corridor. Uh, you know, we've done our best to keep the project at the forefront, even though it was a long process with gaps in progress. You know, again, I can't stress enough that to, we, we remain diligent and kept the project visible. My organization, LPC, also provided over $90,000 between 2015 and 2018 for studies to help keep the project moving forward. Essentially, we really provided a lot of the gap funding for some of the, the studies. Uh, you know, it might not seem like a lot, but our annual budget is around $250,000 a year. So in some years, 20% of our budget was dedicated to seeing the second train uh, through, uh, whether that meant studies and certainly out of our region. Uh, there is, has also been great communication support between local, state, and federal elected representatives for the TCMC. State and federal elected officials' support has transcended political affiliations locally, which has been great. And we've been lucky that way. Whether they have the DRNR are uh, behind their name, our state and federal elected officials were all supportive of the TCMC. And that's a huge benefit. Uh, next slide. You know, why such great support? Uh, everyone recognized the benefits and had to keep that in the forefront. I'll just go through a few of the benefits because these are the things that we had to continue to sell. The additional service provides, you know, better, more reliable service and connections throughout the corridor. We look at increased ridership. The Empire Builder provides around 26,000 right, or users a year at La Crosse. Ridership is expected to double. And obviously that means more people coming in our area, visiting, staying, and economic benefits for everyone. Uh, as, as previously mentioned, better connections to regional business centers, day trip meetings become more feasible. They're currently not feasible in the existing service. Uh, we'll also see a benefit for our students and universities, more transportation options and, and options, and that which certainly removes recruitment for our schools as well. In general, the additional service provides more frequent, reliable service. You know, these selling points, again, what we need to help continue with our local support. Uh, next slide. Just as important, there are some secondary benefits. And again, these are key. And again, we had to continue to promote. In the La Crosse area, just because of the TCMC, we're going to see $32 million in rail infrastructure improvements as a result. We're going to have multiple rail crossings improved. So safety is improved. We're going to reduce gate, town time, gate down times. Our depot is uh, being improved. The Mississippi River Bridge, there's going to be alignment of track and approaches and replace switches. And this has long been a bottleneck for both freight and passenger rail uh, in our area. There are also be signal improvements throughout the corridor. Now, all these improvements allow for freight and passenger rail trains to move faster and more efficiently through our area. And this will also impact rail service to all connected locations. So even in the great Northwest uh, where you're sitting, we'll receive benefits from our rail improvements. Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, just to conclude, you know, being a person that has worked with public transportation coordination throughout my career, one of our biggest struggles with public transportation is first mile and last mile connections, and La Crosse is no different. Uh, La Crosse M2, which is our public bus service, interestingly enough, has never stopped at the Amtrak depot, whether due to the rail crossing, street configuration, 
street configurations of Amtrak dependability that never stopped. So our college students, residents, businesses that never had a public transportation connection to Amtrak. With the TCMC and the added service, MTU will now be providing daily service to the depot in the future. So that's certainly, again, that helped us promote it locally. So if I could boil it down to really, I think, four things that really helped us. We had state DOTs support, state elected local officials, uh, regardless of uh, their political affiliations, all supported. You know, we kept the project visible, kept promoting the benefits. And uh, next slide with that, I'd like to just thank you for the opportunity and hopefully it's been somewhat informative and uh, you know, at any time, feel free to contact me. So appreciate it. Thank you so much, Peter. So we have about 10 minutes for questions and um, okay, straight back there. Thank you. I wanted to uh, thank uh, Senator Gorsick and some of the other folks who made it possible for uh, Dan and myself to do the train trek that uh, he referred to. Uh, we have found that uh, talking to individuals in local communities is really important to make it possible for the visions that we're all sharing to uh, become a reality. So thanks again to Senator Gorsick, to uh, Council Member Clegg, uh, to Mike Christensen, who's here, and several of the, and Dan uh, McFarling, and several of the other folks who've, who've made it possible for us to do this. And we look forward to doing it again. And if anyone is interested in uh, having us uh, do uh, uh, on, the, on the ground interaction with your community, please talk to us, we'd be very interested. Thank you, and then um, <clears throat> we had a question back here behind, um, right there. So more of a comment than a question. Ron Pate, Washington State DOT, Director of Rail Freight and Ports. And I felt I had to kind of say something about some of the comments here. I, I would like to say my team, as far as rail planning, we're one of the best in the nation. I think FRA, if they're here, they will say that we're very successful at federal grants. I'd also like to say, my team, we don't think small. We have looked at all the rail systems. Our uh, Joint Transportation Committees, and I don't know if the Senator knows this, uh, did a study on East-West, uh, independent of WASHDOT, because I asked for that, and it, and it said it wasn't a good idea right now. Very high cost, low ridership. It didn't even include PTC costs. So our position you know, is informed by that study, but we're certainly willing to engage with Amtrak as they look at their national study and looking at that route. So that's kind of where we're at. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ron. And any comment from the panel? Okay. Um, others in the room? Any questions, comments? Oh, Dan. Uh, somewhat to the point of together we can do this. And um, I have a question, and I would indicate that I think Peter Fletcher has uh, provided his answer pretty much on how you get the job done. But what would be the top three recommendations, uh, one to three, of panel members as to how we secure a positive recommendation for both of the routes endorsed by the Greater Northwest Coalition, the North Coast uh, Hiawatha, Limited Hiawatha, uh, and the Pioneer Road? How do we get it done? Top three ways, up to three ways, that we can be successful. We'll start the room with, uh, let's start, start the room with Jim, and then um, we can go to Karen, and then we'll go across the, the um, people on screen. So Jim, go ahead. Okay, so, hold on. Is that, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, I think number one we've actually heard already today, which is, However you do it, you're gonna have to bury whatever hatchet you have to bury and make peace, which means that you have to make sure that you have good partnerships along the way. And the great thing is that BNSF is already um, you know, ex officio in the, in the authority. So you're kind of checking that box. Um, but that is very, very important um, because everyone has to work together to get it done. The second thing I think you have to do is to make sure that the political support is strong and remains strong. Um, I think it's, we've seen too many examples in the past and past programs where the political support waned and people actually gave money back. 
um, we can't have that happen. Um, so the, the support has got to be rock solid. Um, and then I think the third thing is you have to make sure that everyone in the communities that will be served recognizes the benefits to the communities of the service. That this is not about, hey, we want to do a train because we remember it when we were kids and it's cool to have a train. These, these folks need to know that this is something that will benefit them, benefit their families, benefit their businesses, benefit their communities, benefit safety. All of those things have to be addressed and, and reinforced every single time you talk to them because they have to understand why this is a good idea. And it's about a lot more than just running a train. Uh, I think Abe said it uh, this morning, got to go away from being an operation and being a service. So you have to make sure that folks understand the service that will result from these investments. Thank you, Jim. And Karen, do you want to add anything? And then I see um, Chris will be first. Um, he's put his hand up. Oh, I have a lot to add. <laughs> um, but I think I'm going to have to hold back, uh, except on one issue, um, and that is funding. Uh, in doing the planning, uh, and Ron and I have worked together on exactly this issue, it's very important to be realistic about what it's going to cost. And there will be differences of opinion as to what it's going to cost. Uh, but it's got to be based on really good planning and uh, good transparent planning so everybody understands everything that went into it. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, once you get uh, a good understanding of the costs, uh, then just immediately start working on the funding. Uh, and uh, you, can't, you can't start working on funding too early. Both the state funding, the local funding, maybe some private funding, and federal funding, don't assume that money is gonna drop out of the sky. Uh, there will be opportunities that come you know, along the way. Uh, they, up to this date, you know, come every 10 years uh, from the federal government. Uh, and the states, uh, you know, all the states uh, uh, have, um, have their challenges. And, uh, but uh, but that, that's, uh, that would be my second recommendation. Um, and then uh, one point that I wanted to make um, is that we've been talking in, uh, occasionally about uh, interstate compacts. Uh, and the Southern Rail Commission was uh, authorized by an act of Congress. Uh, the um, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey was also authorized by an act of Congress. But if you are not sharing tax revenues, you don't need an act of Congress. So talk to your lawyers about whether you really need to do a congressionally approved interstate compact or whether you can do one based on intergovernmental agreements uh, and so you don't have to go through uh, the machinations and the brain damage of having to go to Congress and get an interstate compact approved. Thank you, Karen. Um, we'll, we'll go over to Chris. Uh, thank you. The one thing I wanted to say is um, the information is there. Um, the folks, uh, one of them was just speaking. The folks have, from all aboard Washington have some excellent statistics about economic development and the uh, positive economic influences that restored train service uh, can provide to a community. The other thing I would say is that um, with the gentleman from Washington, I, my comments are based on what I've heard from other uh, legislators, rail advocates, and so forth. Um, so I shouldn't be speaking for them. But I can definitely tell you the state of Oregon has some problem uh, when it comes to rail. And finally, the one thing to remember about the Pioneer uh, Corridor is that, you know, when it, when it was... Uh, dissolved about 25 years ago, development was much less than it is today. Cities have grown considerably. Greyhound and other transport uh, alternatives have been reduced. Um, airlines have been, you know, have reduced flights to many places. And one last thing that I would say is a lot of times people go, well, you're trying to help private railroads and how is that okay? I would submit to you that if air, airplanes needed uh, rails in the sky, 
that the federal government would do that. And so why is it different for passenger and freight? Because look at how much we invest in airports around the country and all of the infrastructure and everything else. United, Delta, they couldn't function with a lot. They couldn't function well with a, without a lot of that infrastructure. So I see no difference between improving freight lines so that passenger can uh, also um, so the passenger can also thrive. And I think it's kind of um, it's unfortunate that we get into this. Well, that's private, and this is you know airports are public. So anyway, thank you again uh, for allowing me to, to uh, make a comment. Thank you, Senator, and <clears throat> I think we'll go to Peter next because we ended with him. So we'll let Scott have the last word on this question, which is a great question to wrap it up on. So top one, two, or three things you would recommend to those of us who are wanna, wanna work on this and make it happen. Yeah, and I, I, for myself, what I, I heard earlier, the other three things I did, certainly elected official support uh, at all, all levels, that was critical for us. Uh, the re, you know, re, regardless of political affiliation, we, we had that. Uh, DOT support, and also, you know, keep the benefits at the forefront, and don't don't assume that everybody, everybody knows the benefits. Keep them out there and keep promoting. Thank you, and Scott, Thank you'll you. get the last run at that question. Well, I appreciate that, although having the last word when everybody has been so articulate leaves me not a lot to say, right? Uh, but I, I maybe I'll reiterate three things. Um, one is to work together, avoid parochialism. Um, Peter and I would know that La Crosse and Eau Claire are kind of rival communities in a lot of ways. We're similar size, et cetera. Uh, but we all are supportive of expanding service in Wisconsin. And, and we had our city council and county and our chamber supported the TCMC service and the Chrissy applications, et cetera. Um, I think the discussion I've heard on the sessions I've been able to listen in on of the win-win with the post railroads is really important and continue to work on that. And then the other thing that we find when we advocate, those of us that are involved in policy often like to talk about the policy implications. And when you talk to the people in the public, making it real to them. You know, what would the service be like? How would you use it? I heard that discussed this morning as well. Um, making it real to them really helps them understand why they need to say things to their um, DOTs or to their elected officials that this is important. Thank you so Thank much, you. panel. This was really rich, really helpful. We really appreciate it. And we're gonna go straight to, um, yeah, straight to uh, the next item. So thanks, Dave. All right, and we're gonna keep this relatively short and succinct knowing the hour of the day and everything that you have uh, uh, absorbed up until this point. So again, on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority, thank you for joining us for this first and inaugural summit of the Greater Northwest Passenger Rail Coalition and also uh, I thought maybe we would have an announcement to make as far as where the next such summit would occur. We were not quite there yet, but stay tuned for that. Uh, a few just general announcements, and then I want to give you a final opportunity to say anything that you would want before we adjourn here for the day. So thank you also, all summit sponsors. Uh, you all made this possible. Uh, the staff working in the background made this possible, and all of you either virtually attending online or in the room made this possible. I really do hope that you found it valuable, informational, and maybe even a little bit inspiring uh, the past day and a half. Following the summit, there will be a summit evaluation going out for folks to fill out. Uh, this will be uh, something that will be uh, available uh, by way of likely a, an online survey or form. So be on the lookout for that in your inboxes. The dinner that will be happening at 6 o'clock, for those of you who signed up for that, it's not too far away. You go one block to the south, three blocks to the east. That is the depot. And we are delighted to have all of you uh, who can make it for that. If there Are there any slots left, any plates left? I believe we do have plates left if anybody uh, wants to join last minute. Oh, okay, if there are any last minute joiners, 
tie in with uh, Chad, uh, Violet, or Kyla over there in the in the corner, and we'll see if we can't uh, rustle up some grub for you. A few folks have asked, what's the dress code for this thing? Well, you are in luck. You do not need to have your tux and ball gown for this, this event. Uh, business casual is fine, which basically looks like everything that you all are wearing in the room here today. So come on down to the depot, 6 o'clock. It should be great. The auction is still open, so if, uh, if you would love to see a fine piece of artwork in your... Uh, in your home, office, or uh, train car, as the case may be. Uh, check that out, check out the other items, bid online. So finally, this is your opportunity to say any final words, either uh, the leaders who participated in organizing this event or uh, any of the rest of you participants. Uh, I think for uh, many years and in many contexts, we approach passenger rail, have approached passenger rail from a, a position of scarcity rather than abundance, of, of obstacles rather than opportunities. Well, I, I think we've made the case as articulately as we can that together this is something that we can do. And, uh, and we, as we go forward, um, the bipartisan infrastructure law I think is pretty clear in a path forward, and a path forward for reestablishing uh, what would be the 16th and 17th long distance passenger rail national network routes in the country. And so we're pretty excited about that opportunity with the breadth and array of folks who have been assembled here from the Pacific Northwest to the Lake States. We've seen other opportunities for inner city corridors um, and that, too, is something that is on the table. Uh, President Clegg, is there anything that you'd like to add before opening it up for the audience? Just a couple words. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, how many... It was almost two years ago uh, I learned that Dave was interested in passenger rail. Uh, John Robert Smith from Transportation for America helped us get together Hel uh, the Rail Passengers Association helped do a couple of webinars. We had a Zoom meeting and almost 50 people showed up and, and we were shocked. We didn't know that so much latent interest was out there. We knew people like trains, but we didn't know uh, how much interest was there. And so it's because of that interest, because of all of you that were here today, that we got the things in the bill, that we got in the bill, and that we now have an opportunity to use those things to actually get this rail reestablished. Um, I think Dave and I both said, uh, this is not a long-term project. Look at my hair. I'm not going to be here for very long. long it's not, so I don't, I don't want to say 25 years from now we have passenger rail. I want to say 10 years from now we have passenger rail. And that's what I'm looking at. To get to that means we have to make progress every single year. And that means using this planning money to get those plans done, get the track improved, get the coalitions together, and hopefully get this study uh, to declare that we are worthy of long distance service and uh, that'll get the wheels rolling. Um, I wish I could say for sure, but look forward to next year and I hope we can be in Boise uh, that's all I'll say at this point, but, but really um, excited to keep this ball rolling. Any, any final comments from any, anyone? And I, and I, too, don't want to be riding a train on the f uh, funeral train, so to speak, so I'm with you, Elaine, on that. Any final questions, comments? Uh, on your way out, we do have the flip, sh uh, flip chart still at the uh, Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority booth. If you have any last ideas as far as public engagement relative or anything else relative to the so-called Section 22214 study that FRA has informed us about. Okay. I heard a sigh there. Okay, I, I think that's it. Uh, we'll call it a wrap. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Safe travels.